Well, good morning, everyone. We're having such an uplifting time of worship together. My name's Ron Quinn. I want to welcome you here to uh, Valley Church, a time that we really pray and hope that you'll be uplifted and you'll also be brought closer to God. Let's uh, go to God in prayer as uh, we enter a time of uh, being in the Word of God. Father, we're very grateful for the worship of you, for the uplift that comes to our hearts when we set our minds on you. So thankful that you take us all, the broken vessels that we are, and as we've sung, you, you really mend our wounds and you lift us up. Thank you for the wonderful and powerful impact that you have on us. Thank you for the goodness and the mercy that we are able to live in in your presence all the days of our life. And we pray that right here and now you would receive our worship and also that we could enter into a time in your word that would be helpful to us, that would give guidance to our lives. We pray for everyone here that this will be good time spent. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. So we are in week three of our new series, which is Freedom. And if you're just joining us, just to catch you up, in week one, Cesar Lopez brought the introductory message and let us know we're going to be bringing our lessons out of the book of Galatians. Galatians is a book of the Bible that, among other things, has freedom as a major theme. Freedom from other additional rules and burdens that religion could put on us, but to be able to enjoy the grace that God intends for us to have in our relationship with him. He also talked about the stories of freedom, the freedom stories that God wants to be writing in each of our lives and that each of us has a story of freedom in Jesus that God's been writing and yet to be written, and that's our our exploration and our enjoyment is finding out what that is. And last week, Gary Smith talked to us about the dramatic change that took place in the life of the Apostle Paul and that Gary's experienced that same kind of change in his life growing up in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And he showed a picture of his crew that, that he hung out with at that time and that you never would have thought that the guy who was in that picture as Gary Smith would now be a youth minister on high school campuses, teaching hundreds of young people about how to turn their lives around and have a bright and awesome future, and that that's only because of Jesus working in his life with the freedom that he could bring, that he could experience that, and that, that that's, that's for all of us, uh, what, what God wants to do in our lives. So uh, we're picking up with week three here, and a key scripture through all of the book of, Revel uh, of Galatians Verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 13 says, You were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. There is a freedom that we can enjoy, the freedom of forgiveness, the freedom of when you mess up, when you're not at your best. God is going to clear the slate and give you a new start, a new beginning each, each time we enter into his forgiving presence. But what do we do with that forgiveness and that grace? Do we just think, well, I'm going to keep sinning because he's going to keep forgiven as, as well he would, but that's not the use of our freedom that God intends for us to have. And that, that we have uh, passions and we have desires and things that we might otherwise want to indulge in our life and the idea is to use our freedom, not for indulgence, but to serve and to make a difference in the lives of other people. Nonetheless, we're going to today look at the big topic of freedom to pursue your passion. That God has put a fire within each of us. And if we could only tap and retap the fire, and when the flame goes out, have it reignited in our life because there's so much energy that, that God would give to us and that he would bring forth from us that could be for good if we could hand it over to him. But sometimes uh, the passion in our life, though powerful, can be a problem. And we've got to deal with that. Uh, this is the story of the Apostle Paul. Just to, to go back in the Galatians chapter 1 and review a couple of points that Gary brought out last week. And for those of you joining us for the first time today, you'll be caught right up here with this. 
Paul is describing his past, and he says, You've heard of my previous way of life, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. So there's insight into the guy's makeup, into what was this man who became the Apostle Paul. He was intense. He was an intense guy. And there was an intensity in him that he used for persecution and destruction. Could you notice in your life any forces that before Jesus or before you grew and matured in your life, there were powerful forces, but they were destructive? And you can look in the lives of other people that were destroyed or hurt or injured. You can look in your own life and see the wake of destruction that occurred because of those powerful forces in your life. This was the story of the Apostle Paul pre-Jesus. Intense, destructive. He goes on and he says, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father. So here's an ambitious guy. And as he looked sideways at his contemporaries, people his own age, he looked at the lanes that they were traveling in and the speed with which they were going through life, and he saw that he was in the fast lane. He was on the fast track. Such was the ambition in his life. He was getting ahead. He was setting the pace. And it was not just zeal, but extreme zeal. So what do we know about him? He's an extremist and he's a zealot. But all of that energy was being used for something that was really looking backwards. Stuck in the past on the traditions of his fathers rather than what new and powerful thing God might otherwise want to have done in his life. So then all of this energy that was going on in him, what did it lead to? The book of Acts, chapter 9 and verse 1, describes it this way, that Saul was breathing out murderous threats. See, this energy left unchecked and unguided by the Spirit of God had gotten to the point of murderous threats. That's really powerful and really, really harmful. That's how far it had gone in his life. And then Paul, in his own self-assessment, said, writing to Timothy, he said, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man. Okay, that's, that's a picture. Now, it's a picture of fire. It's a picture of high energy. It's a picture of passion. That, that God really had put in the guy's life and in his heart for something, but not for this. Not for something that would be so harmful, so, so murderous, so violent, so hurtful. Could we look in our lives and could we see passions and energies? And as we've seen those, those uh, things where, the, where the, the tip of the iceberg emerges out of the water and it's revealing a whole lot of other stuff going on there, but where it has been harmful where it has been destructive. This is, this is a story of Paul before Jesus. And then this dramatic change takes place in his life, and then a completely different description about him occurs. For instance, this one, and again, in Galatians chapter 1, where he's describing what other people said about him. They said, the man who formerly per persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And then it says, they praise God because of me. You think about the impact that you've had on other people. And for Paul, it was people were afraid of him. He came, people wanted to go into hiding and run the other way. This was, this was his impact. And you think about the impact you might have had on people and how could that change and how it could become different to where people could praise God for you. People could be thanking God for the difference you're making in their life and the impact that you're having. This was this was the description of the Apostle Paul. So what we want to do now, because we have him breaking it down for us, we want to dial into some of the, the, the specific ways that he described the point where the chains came off in his life, where he went from this otherwise violent man, destructive person, to somebody that could be so helpful and, and somebody that, that brought about praise of God 
in the hearts of those that he influenced. So he steps us through it. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Here's the point. Now, we need to know this about the apostle. He, of, of all the, the New Testament writers, gave us the idea of one another Christianity and the togetherness and the each otherness that is part of our faith. There's a lot of teaching from Paul on the need we have for others in our life, on the need for community, on the need for connection, that we can't go it alone. We need a lot of help if we're going to make it through this, this challenging journey. So that's, that's there and not to be taken away from and the need in our life. However, alongside of that, we have this teaching, that there was something in his life that he says it was not of human origin. It came directly in my heart from the Lord himself. And there are things. There are things that are life-changing, points of the chains coming off in our life, points of freedom that are only going to happen by direct connection with the Lord himself, that are going to be, as he puts it here, received by revelation from Jesus. There's things that we receive from people, and then there's things that we receive from the Lord himself. This is the impact that he's describing was had in his life. He really wants us to get, not from human origin, revealed, and that's a key word we're going to look at, revealed from Jesus himself to Paul. He goes on in verse 15. When God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see, to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. It's interesting language. You might think of him saying uh, that God in his grace revealed his son to me, and that would be true. There's things that are revealed to us, but Paul is describing a deeper impact, something that goes a lot deeper, and the language he uses is he was revealed, his son was revealed, God in his grace revealed his son in me. There's things that need to go deeper, and only God can take them there, to deeper in our heart to where Jesus is revealed in us. So this idea of not from people, but from God, being revealed from him is the description. And then he gives us this, this geographic placement that from this time of impact, he went into Arabia. Now, what do you picture when you think of Saul, soon to become the Apostle Paul, in Arabia? There were no photographers there. So we have to imagine. But here's what I imagine. I imagine him out there. I mean, it's a desert. And he's in the desert, and it's just him and the Lord. And in that time with Paul, in the desert, just him and the Lord, amazing things, transformative things, chains coming off, things happen in his life. And this is for him, and we're going to see it's for us. But, but the, the wilderness, it was something that happened to Jesus right after his baptism at the beginning of his ministry. It's something that happened to Paul, and it's going to happen for all of us. It could be both very, very specific what we're going through. We're in the wilderness. We're in the desert. But it could be metaphorical, too, of seasons in our life that are really times of suffering, the wilderness of suffering, the wilderness of, and desert of, of disappointment, of failure, of loss, of of some painful variety in our life. There's, there's pain that's emotional. There's pain that's physical. That could be our Arabian desert experience. There's a, 
a wrestling with our, our characters. There's wrestling with the betrayal or disappointment of other people in our life, of, of conflict that goes on in the inevitable course of human events. Any and any of, the, any of these or all of these that sometimes could show up in our life and we find ourselves really alone and really isolated. When that happens, take note. God could be wanting to do something that can only happen out in the desert. That can only happen when we're actually, we are separated enough from people that it's just us and the Lord. This is what was happening to him. Now, the word reveal, revelation, is the word apocalypsis. You know, apocalypse. I know. It conjures ideas of zombies running around, you know, we got to deal with them, or, or, you know, aliens coming and declaring war on planet Earth, or, or all-out thermonuclear war. But the original idea from whence it came is to, to take the cover off to reveal what was otherwise previously hidden, to make known a disclosure, a manifestation, an appearance, spiritual enlightenment and revelation. What Paul is describing is that there were things in his life that were hidden to him. There was some kind of a block there, and then it wasn't, it wasn't him coming to Jesus, it was Jesus coming to him and taking the blind, removing the block, removing the barrier. Oh my, that needs to happen in our lives. We all have, even now, we have barriers, we have blocks, things. Other people may get it, other people may see it, but we're not. And there's that, that time where maybe it's going to be in the desert. Maybe it's only going to be a time of suffering and difficulty that's finally going to take you to that point. We need really a, a personal apocalypse. The moment where the chains really are broken and, and we're zeroing, we're allowed to zoom in on it in the life of the Apostle Paul where he says, it was revealed to me. It was revealed to me when God by his grace chose to reveal his son in me. It was not by people it was revealed to me by God. We, we need that in our life where the chains could come off because we see, we see things differently. We might be seeing God differently. We see his mercy. We see his love. We see his forgiveness. We see his acceptance on a level like that's been blocked for us before. Or it might be we see his holiness. We see his purity. We see his light. It might be seeing ourselves like never before, we, and it takes courage. And sometimes it really does take an apocalyptic moment to break through, to see what's going on in our life. I've had to have that, the pride in me that, that probably everybody else saw, and everybody else around me was praying, God, please help him to see his pride. But I wasn't getting it. And he's had to, he's had to bring me to there again and again. Things that, that might be just, just outside of our reach, that all of a sudden are brought front and center, seeing ourselves like never before, seeing the world. First of all, in the points that we, that we love the world rather than God and we, we cling to the world and we want the world, we're enamored by the world, to see it for how it really is, how empty, how unsatisfying, how fleeting and, and futile it all really is. And in a moment, it's all everything that we might have otherwise invested in, it's all going to be gone. And people that, that that's all they have are going to have absolutely nothing in a breath. Or, or to see in a different way, to see in its brokenness how in need of help and in need of compassion and in need of answers and love the people around us are and to see the world in a different way like that. So we could say, well, yeah, he was an apostle and he met Jesus so directly, so of course that's for him, but you know, it's actually this kind of personal apocalypse, this kind of taking what was otherwise hidden and having the cover taken off and seeing it like you've never seen it before, it's for us too. For instance, Ephesians 1, 17, Paul talks about his praying. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Sometimes we're blocked just in the depth and the growing and the knowing of our relationship with God and knowing him. And man, to have, to have a revelation, to see him 
better and know him more clearly than we ever have before. That'll change your life. An encounter with God like that will have everything else change in its importance and its perspective. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2, What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, I mean, it's, it's beyond your wildest imaginings, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. I'll tell you what, this will set you free. Having this kind of encounter with God to where God pulls the veil away, pulls the curtain back, and shows you things about what he wants for you, what he has for you. And it's been there all along. It's like been just, just within reach of you, but, but you haven't known it was there. You haven't known the love that was there. You haven't known what he wants to do with your life, the difference that he wants to make in your life. You see, with Paul, he had all these energies that were so destructive this way, but in God's hands, those very same energies became so powerful for changing lives. You could take your worst moment, I mean, the, 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 the moment of your greatest brokenness, and right there, you probably got into that moment because of some misdirected passion and some misguided energy. Take that energy and put it in the hands of God, with God showing you what he really meant that for, with God revealing to you what you were meant to be, and that could ignite a fire in your soul unlike anything else you've ever experienced. So this is, this is for us too, not just for the apostle. Now Paul goes on then, or, or we want to look at one more first before we go on with Paul, and that, that's, that's Jesus interacting with his disciples on the same point of, of what we could only see as revealed to us from God. Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you're Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. There is a thing, and it's stated over and over again in our study today. There is a something that can only occur in our lives, not by flesh and blood, but can only occur by God. Don't you want that? Don't you, don't you long for that? Could anything else do once you realize the possibility of that? That's, that's what's available to us. Now, what the Lord wants to do, first of all, is for that to change our life. But then clearly, he has something else in mind. He wants to leverage that revealed to thing in us. He wants to leverage it for the building of his church. Because in the mind of Jesus, the church is his bride, his beloved. In the heart of Jesus, the church was that for which he shed his blood for. In the mind of Jesus, the church, it's teaching of the gospel, and it's living the lives of the beloved in the community around us. The church is the hope of the world. And he wants to take what was our worst moment and turn it into our best moment, and then he wants to leverage that through the building of the church to change the world. Are you open? Are you sensing? Do you have any idea of what your point of contact and the point that, that could be what was your lowest, be your highest expression of the power that God put in you and created in you for good? So Paul goes on then, and he describes in chapter 2 of Galatians his further experience. After 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem in response to a revelation. So a lot of time has gone by Meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I had preached among the Gentiles. They recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. So, so when you get a revelation from God, when God gives you new insight, takes the cover off, the point is to act on it. 
to act in response to the revelation that he gives you. That's what Paul does. And what he's realizing that he saw in his life and then what other people came to realize was the trust that God had given to Paul. His trust, his task was to the uncircumcised, to the, the non-Jewish world. Could you verbalize? Could you articulate the trust and the task that God has given you. We believe that, that God has given the Valley Church a task of proclaiming his name to the 1.77 million of the San Fernando Valley. That, that's what we're called to do. And we want to together be the best we can be to fulfill that task. That's, that's us as a church. What is our individual expression of that? It became so obvious to Paul that the way he then lived his life, it became recognizable to other people what his thing was, what his task was. He goes on. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me. You know, God wants to work in every one of us like this. As an apostle to the Gentiles, James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. So God working in his life from this point of seeing things like he had never seen before, maybe himself, maybe God, maybe the lost world, seeing things, certainly seeing Jesus like he had never seen him before, this was so transformative in his life, the chains falling off in his life, that, that he now had an expression of grace going on through him that became obvious to everybody around him. Okay, so there are some brands, there are some logos that are really obvious to us. Here's a few, Starbucks, McDonald's, and right there in the center is the LA Dodgers, because, you know, you know it, it is what it is. So you look at these and you just know. You know what they stand for. You know what they're about. The idea is for there to be recognizable grace in our lives. Real touch points that because of what we've experienced from God and, and whatever, whatever it might have been without him, it's just so now changed. And it's so, as he said, not to indulge our flesh, but to serve others in love that, that we're really ignited to serve him. And it, it kind of becomes to others, brand Jesus living through us in a recognizable way. So we're going to kind of pause here now. And especially if you're visiting with us today, we're glad you're here. And you can park here. That, that's everything for you. We're going to transition to a little bit of family talk now. Uh, we do this every once in a while because this is our time when we're all together and um, talking about our opportunities uh, to let God's grace be demonstrated through us through the giving opportunities that this church gives us. And, and the first we want us to think about is our, our offering with hope and missions. It's coming up October 21st. And we have a little video of the work that hope is doing around the world, this one after the volcano eruption in Guatemala back in June. So let's roll the video.
salir. bendiciones a ustedes y a su familia y a todos los que colaboraron bendiciones para todos, les queremos mucho is that it's recognizable grace. As it was in Paul, it would be through us and that this really would be the grace of giving that we're excelling in. So there's our weekly, or for some, of some they give monthly, but it's, it's consistent, though it were every week. And that's for all our, our ministry funding. We will fund sometimes hope and missions from our general fund that the weekly offering uh, gives to. Uh, sometimes uh, there's expenses that go on around the building. For instance, since we've been here, meeting here, we've not tapped into any of our building fund because we're waiting till we purchase this or somewhere else. But we've had some repairs and expenses that have, have been generated from here, and that's out of the, the general fund, and, and certainly other, other needs that come up. But there's our weekly, monthly offering, and then there's a missions and hope offering. All of that, when it's given there, goes for our global outreach around the world through our partnerships with our missionaries in Russia and Central Asia and Hope Worldwide. And then there's a year and a half ago, our Mission Possible campaign that we began for our building fund. The idea was after renting for so many years, 11 years in a public high school, we really believed that, that God was calling us to, to create some sacred space where a place of grace, you know, a gathering place where that could be totally devoted to the work of God 24-7 around the clock, and we could make it awesome, and we could have a, a real inviting feel about it, and so, you know, we're, we're giving to that, and then ongoing, there are other needs that come up, sometimes requests, the food drive, toy drive, and other things, so that's, that's a picture of the giving that we can do in this church. Now, um, you might want to think about, well, where, where is your involvement in that, and how do, you, how do you place in that? We'd like you to think about prioritizing them in this way, but that's kind of up to you. That's between you and God. Uh, but some other things to consider about our Mission Possible update, uh, uh, about four months ago, we did an update and told you that the funding at that time was $304,000, which was amazing at that time. 
go forward four months, and here's where it's at now. It's now at $421,560. So that's just so great. And people that have pledged, and again, that, the pledge is coming up to over a million dollars, and we're so excited about what God's going to be able to do with that, and every month it just keeps building and going along. So the funding phase is going really well, thanks to the Lord and thanks to your giving spirits. And then there's the finding. Now, we found this place, and we had it appraised at $1.86 million dollars. And we've submitted that to the Lutherans who own this but don't have a congregation meeting here. And they're supposed to meet sometime in September. We don't know when, and we haven't heard anything back from them. But they're considering the appraisal as our offer. And we'll know from there what might or might not be received from them. But we're working with that as a concept of, of our down payment uh, for something about that much. And then we're thinking about, OK, so then to occupy it and to fill it, what would the ongoing commitment be? And, and now here's where we're at with our, our weekly offering and our current commitments. And then you take what we'd have to be paying on, on a loan to finish out purchasing a place like this. We're about $2,000 a week short. So that's part of why we want to have this talk about the power of God and the grace of God being recognizable in you. Because as it is, we have about half the church that's like really on board and is just like super consistent on their weekly giving. And for whatever reason, then it kind of trails off from there. And we have, we have a certain percentage of people that just haven't decided to make the weekly giving part of what they do. And here's what I want you to hear from me. We can't do it without you. I mean, really. And you might think, well, when I, where I'm at and it's not that significant. No, it actually really, really is. And it's possible that, that the Lord is just giving us a little bit more time. Maybe that's why the Lutherans haven't responded back to us yet, because it's giving us all an opportunity to really get connected to this and to, to dream together about what could God do with a place that we had all the time and we could make it incredible. So that's something for you to think about. And now we're going to transition to taking communion. And a scripture that fits in with this topic and grace being recognizable and visible and thinking about the book of Galatians and what we learn in that is this scripture from Galatians 1, verse 3 and 4. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. You think about the being rescued and the chains coming off and that really powerful and explosive moment in our lives of, of forgiveness and of salvation and of eternal life. But that is brought to us by Jesus giving of himself. The rescue came into our lives because Jesus gave of himself. And that's what we want to meditate on as we take the bread reminds us of Jesus bearing our sins. As we drink from the cup, it reminds us of Jesus pouring out his blood to forgive us. And our hope is, is that as the scripture begins, grace and peace, that this could be a moment right now of complete grace and complete peace in our lives as we meditate on his forgiveness for us. Let's pray. Lord, we... I'm just so grateful that you want to show us things about you, that you want to break into our lives and our dullness and our resistance and our distance from you. You want to span the gap, and you want to show us your love and your glory and your goodness. May we see that more, and even now in the communion time as we partake of what Jesus instituted and what Jesus did for us, that we could receive the grace and the peace in our hearts that you want for us. We pray through Jesus. Amen.